Welcome, welcome to Hepatica Week on Thursday. We have heard so many interesting uh, stuff about Hepatica nobilis. Uh, the name of this week uh, stems from the first name, the Latin name of Hepatica nobilis, the beautiful liver leaf or Leberblümchen or Blauweiss in Norwegian. So today we are going to continue our education. Um, my name is Bente Liliabi. I'm a neuroscience expert and a nature-loving gadget geek. And that's why I took on this fun project uh, where we all will learn to become a citizen scientist in the, by the end of the week. So to, before I introduce the panel today, I will just uh, recapture what we have learned so far. Uh, on Monday, we learned how to download the uh, app called My Seasons, where the Hepatica nobilis or the uh, liver leaf is one of the species that you can observe. A new game was uh, you were given an uh, instruction on how to do that. Now, on Thursday, you learn about the flower itself. We reveal hepatica secrets. And we also told you about where the data we collect goes in the end at the uh, Global uh, Biodiversity Information Center uh, facility. And yesterday, we learned that there are so many more applications that we can use and um, we create depending on what our interest is. And we also learn how to make our own maps. Today, we will look closer to what happens with the pictures we take with My Seasons, for instance, of uh, the liver leaf. We will see how we can actually upload it ourselves into the system, uh, where it will then be quality assured and validated, and then in the end become real scientific data. And one of the aspects that is important for data collection by us as citizens is to have common standards and, um, and data about the data. And you will get a little piece of information about that, too. So let's get started. Uh, I have uh, three experts with me today. And uh, the first one I would like to introduce is Nils. Nils, can you uh, present yourself and what you are doing? Yes, I'm Nils uh, Vollan. I'm uh, responsible for the ICT development team in the Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center in Trondheim, in Norway. And I've been responsible for the, uh, for the development and the implementation of a species observation system that uh, I'm going to present uh, just now. Thank you, thank you. We are looking forward to that. And next is Evan. Evan, can you present yes. yourself? Yes. Uh, my name is Evan Volstad Hansen, and I'm working in the Norwegian Biodiversity Network, which uh, organizes the voluntarily biologists in Norway. And we're working with uh, validation of the uh, observations in the spaces database that Nils will tell about. Yeah, so you belong to a, a big important force that helps uh, validate and uh, calibrate the data uh, or quality, quality assure the data. And then finally, Bart. Hi, Bente. This is Hi. Bart. I work for the Open Geospatial Consortium. We are a standards developing organization, 550 members worldwide that contribute to our standards. OGC also participates in a project on uh, citizen science called Web. I'll be talking about that soon. So, yeah, look forward to this call. Super. Thanks, uh, Bente, for having us on. Uh, thank you for coming. It will be super great to, uh, to uh, learn the, the technical details in a fun way today, I'm sure. So, Nils, let's get started. I would like to share my screen with you. Uh, you can see it. Uh, now you can see it. Yes. It is a species observation system. Uh, it is an important source of data on species occurrence in uh, Norway. And first, I would like to 
demonstrate how you can upload uh, sighting. Then we open the species observation system in Norwegian Arts Observationer. It is a reporting system for species. Then uh, I have an account here and I log in uh, with my username and my password and now I'm inside. Now I can submit sighting and I can do it by a report form and then first I have to uh, uh, choose where to locate it. The map location on the right side of the screen, there is a site, there is a location where I found a liver leaf. And now I'm going to upload it. So then I read, uh, I write the name and I do it in Norwegian now, uh, the Norwegian name. Uh, then it is uh, yesterday and it was uh, 10 square meters with this uh, species on that location. So then I submit it. Afterwards, I have to quality control it by myself so that I'm happy about the quality, the parameters that are going to join this uh, and you see that the, the name is the taxon name is there, the quantity, the site, the name of the site, and there is a, of course a, a coordinate behind. And then I can upload a picture of a, a proof of uh, that this liver leaf is found. So then I have to select the image. Um, I'll go to. Uh, place where I have stored it. It is here. Hepatica week. This are, here it is. Then I upload it and now it is, you can see it. I close here and now it, now is the, the real thing. Now I'm publishing this I think. So then uh, I can look at it it is a couple of minutes, so then it will show up here. And uh, I can see the, the, the image as well. Uh, here is the image of this uh, sighting. Beautiful plant. Um, well, that was uh, a little demonstration of how to upload a uh, uh, a, a, a picture and how you can join, you can put this data into the system. And now I'm going to talk a bit more about the species observation system. Key information here. It is, re uh, as I mentioned, a reporting system for species occurrence with a Norwegian and Swedish and uh, English user interface. We started in 2008, together with Evan, as he will probably mention. Uh, there was a new version last year. For the time being, there are more than 14 million records. Uh, and that comprise more than 60% of the all available geographical occurrence data in Norway. The Norwegian uh, NGOs are the, the biggest one is the Bird Society, so they are uh, very, very fond of registering uh, sightings uh, of birds. So, 87% of the birds uh, of the content is birds. There are eight, 19,800 species uploaded into this system, and. Uh, for the time being, there are about 9,400 active repertoires. A lot of, uh, of the records uh, has pictures as a proof. It is not a common uh, picture of uh, the species, but that specific 
species on that specific location on that specific day. And the possibility is that people can comment on this, and I'm explaining it uh, a bit afterwards how they are doing it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the validation process because uh, Evan is doing that. So what has happened, uh, the, this, this uh, uh, citizen science system started in Sweden in year 2000 and we have a, a made a Norwegian version and now we have uh, cooperated with them to make a, a version that is uh, uh, a new and a common version. It, it, it looks uh, uh, almost like the same functionality in Sweden as well. And in Sweden, actually, they have uploaded more than 50 million records for the time being during 16 years. Well, uh, we have a, had a close cooperation with the Norwegian Biodiversity Network and their member organizations uh, all the time from day one. So I think that is one of the key factors to success is to cooperate, to come to get funding from the, author, uh, the uh, environmental authorities, to have contact with uh, NGOs, with uh, with naturalists, and then you have have to have an institution with the purpose of data collection and sharing. So that is uh, and and big Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center. <coughs> All data is available in GEBIF. We are sharing it in, uh, in the GEBIF data portal. And the data are heavily used all the time by sp in special planning and environmental management in municipalities, in regional and national sector authorities and agencies, in forestry, research institutes and other scientific institutions are using these data of this system. The basic principle and features, I just want to mention it because it's very important and I hope you see the beautiful picture that my wife has uh, taken uh, some years ago. Well, the first thing, and it's very important for quality, is that there is no anonymous reporting possible. You have to have a, a, a name, you, and your name is connected to the citing all through the system. They are they are always there. You never lose the connection with the with the who's the found the, the species at that specific date and specific location. And in it function as a personal field diary for the for the people there. Often people has written their sightings in the books, but now if they upload it, they can have a digital version of it and with very rich functionality. So that is one of the success factors that uh, there should be a rich uh, functionality for the users so that they will be happy about uh, the, the possibility to view their own data and others as well. The very, very basic principle is, that we are using is that we, 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 to allow crowdsourcing, we public, first publication and quality control and assurance afterwards. Because if a person uploads a picture on a species, there are lots of people with with even higher ex expertise on that species group that are commenting, and many of the comments uh, are on the, uh, on the species identification uh, correction, and even or or can, for birds it may be uh, the age and the sex and the age. The, there are lots of uh, features that they are that they are commenting on. So actually, there is a, a quite a, a voluntary quality control system within this uh, system. One of the big important features is that 
the repeters own their own species records. They can delete them and they can uh, change them and they can make differences. So if somebody is correcting them, they have to correct themselves in the system. Change the name, change the date, or there are other, uh, other misunderstandings. They can, they can uh, change it. There are selected, the threatened species data are formally quality controlled by appointed validators in the biodiversity community and, and Evan will tell more about it. And the last thing I will mention is that uh, the sensitive species are shielded under a certain location. So we have a, a special distribution system for the, for the sensitive species uh, in, a, in a way. Well, that was uh, the main thing that uh, I would like to, to mention. There are uh, um, more details in the, in the spreadsheet uh, and in the presentation afterwards, but I, uh, there is no time for going into detail there. So thank you for your, for your listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Nils. That was that was really interesting. Um, I have, of course, a few questions, and one question that I I wanted to to ask now with respect to the demonstration, because what I liked about your presentation is that it's very actionable. I mean, uh, people after watching your presentation will be helped to uh, to register their observations, and. Um, I have one problem with uh, that I have encountered when I wanted to register my picture, and that was the number of flowers. I mean, you indicated an area of where uh, you found the flower. So if you look at the uh, liver leaf, you know that the liver leaf is found like like uh, single flowers. Sometimes they are just a single flower or a couple, and other times there are huge, you know, areas with uh, with the flowers. Um, people can watch the uh, I, I you know I do uh, the live periscope every day and show different areas with with the, the liver leaf, so they will understand that sometimes you have a single flower and sometimes you have a many. How do you? Is that not a relevant information? I mean, it seems like you are you were just describing a ten square meter or you know very little. Well, actually, uh, actually, uh, in, in this case, I I to, when you have a colony or something, yeah, then you can choose to to say that this was uh, ten square meters or something equivalent. Yeah. But you can choose to to, uh, to count the number of of um, the number of uh, specimen on the location as well. So you, okay. it, it's it's up to you, what what uh, what is beneficial because this some some species are uh, you can count them, uh, but there is if there are huge colony of big, uh, big uh, of big plants, certainly it's easier to. To have the relative abundance with uh, with uh, square meters or something, thousand square meters, for example, it's not uncommon. And you can even, if you want, you can you can uh, draw a, a line around the, the location so that it's so uh, it's so you can locate it either by a point or a, or a polygon. You choose. You can. You had the possibilities in the map uh, resource that is available for the reporters. Okay, I see. So there, are, there are several possibilities there, and and one of the reasons I'm asking is that when it comes to citizen science, the the quality of the observation is often an issue. Now you mentioned that you have to. Um, attach uh, a person, an observer, to each of the observations, which is important for uh, provenance. You know, when you have data, you need to be able to 
to go back to who did the observations. That, that's really important in science. And very often it is. Sometimes you can, it's the amount that, that's important as well, but, but often that's the case. And um, when it comes to, to quality assurance, I, Evan will talk more about that now, so I think maybe I will uh, wait with more questions until after Evan has given his presentation on this, but okay. I just wanted to point to it. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Nils. Um, Evan, uh, we are looking forward to hear more about the uh, validation and the quality assurance then. What, how exactly does that happen? Yes, I try to give you a picture of what it looks like, and I will share the screen here to see if we can get this right. Can you see my screen now? I see the screen, but it's not in the... Uh it's not in uh, I'll try to the uh, the right format for uh, screening. No. Uh, second. Let's see. Uh, there. No. There. You, yes. Perfect. Yeah. You can go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Quality assurance is, of course, important for these kind of data. Uh, and I will talk about the uh, validation of data in the Norwegian Species uh, Observation System, in Norwegian called Arch Observationer. Uh, our member organizations in the Biodiversity Network uh, is doing the validation especially the BirdLife uh, Norway, which has a large amount of data to validate, but also botanists in the Botanical Association, um, mycologists, entomologists, and zoologists are participating in this. Who is the validator? It's a person, of course, an expert, especially in the taxonomy of a group of species. Often you need special skills in, in special groups uh, to point out the right characters for determining a species. But the expert uh, also needs to be familiar with the distribution of the species in Norway, or at least in the parts of country. For instance, in Norway, we have uh, the northern limits of many species, uh, often the world limits uh, of the distribution, and it's very important to know these uh, things in detail when we get uh, uh, observations reported. Uh, the validator has a special access in the system login, and and through the system, he gets a certain role that uh, suits the taxonomic and geographic qualification. For instance, uh, <coughs> you have the right to validate uh, mammals uh, in the Buskerud County of Norway. Then you cannot uh, validate fish or, or vascular plants, but you can only validate mammals. And you can only validate in Buskerud County and not in the neighboring counties like Telemark or Oppland. Uh, or you can have rights to the whole country, of course. Uh, so it's limitations in what you can validate as an expert. Uh, we have the concern of the three S's. Uh, Species, site, and season as the most most important things we validate. Uh, the correct taxonomic determination is, of course, very important. And we often have picture material to look at, <coughs> help us with the determination. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes there also could be specimens. It's uh, possible to to um, register with specimens also in the system, and then you indicate uh, what kind of herbarium or collection the specimen will be donated to. Uh, the correct geographic situation is, of course, important. Um, the um, the um, uh, coordinates must be correct. Uh, for instance, we, you can see a terrestrial species that's in the ocean. Then there must be something wrong with the the uh, coordinates uh, and vice versa if it's a marine mammal that is uh, registered uh, on land then it's something wrong with with the coordinates uh, we also look at the season uh, it should match the known season for the species that's very important um, for instance, the liver leaf, uh, Hepatica nobilis, uh, observed uh, blooming in August is uh, not correct. It blooms in uh, March, April, uh, perhaps May, and we could have a late blooming season in the late uh, autumn, but never in August. Of course, it's uh, very important for tracking birds uh, that the season is correct. Uh, the validation process is um, a bit complicated. Uh, the pre-validation uh, could be done before you sending data to the system. Uh, the uh, <coughs> data could be uh, checked in uh, Facebook sites, in discussion fora, uh, with different experts in advance. And then you send them to the system. And when you report them in the system, uh, you'll get a automatic vali validation before publication. The uh, the uh, <coughs> system tells you, for instance, that uh, the observation is out of range. It has never been uh, reported from this uh, county or municipality before. Then you get a warning, uh, and you can, of course, overrule that warning and go further, or you can acknowledge the warning and stop the publication of the observation. And then uh, you make the publication and then it's spread on the internet uh, and officially publicated. And <clears throat> then the manual validation will uh, set in. Uh, that is the experts examining the the uh, observation. Uh, <clears throat> there you have different ways of uh, what we do with the observation. Uh, most of the observations uh, are approved uh, as correct. Uh, and then get a kind of, of recognition that it's uh, correct uh, according to the, the photographic material or, or, or something like that. Uh, if there are some questions, you can start a dialogue in the system with the observer reporter of the, uh, of the observation. It could be something wrong with the with the coordinates, or something wrong with the the uh, determination. That is, a uh, uh, pictures uh, shows it to be another species than uh, than you have said. 
then you ask the the validator will ask the reporter um, questions and try to correct the observation. Uh, if uh, the reporter doesn't answer or nothing happens with the uh, the observation, uh, the validator can uh, politely decline the the observation. It also means that it will be refused and and not be seen public publicly anymore. So that is in uh, very short terms uh, what the uh, the <coughs> validation system uh, looks uh, like, and there are uh, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, uh, sightings that have been validated. Uh, we have um, uh, an agreement with the, with the species information system that we validate the red listed species and also species uh, that are invasive to Norway and, and such things. We have not the capacity to validate everything in the database. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Evan. Can you turn back to your uh, to your video? So we see. Okay. You. <laughs> <laughs> we see you. Uh, it, it was really really interesting to to see the detailed description of how uh, it's it's yeah it's it's a rather complicated uh, system. But then again, it is complicated to uh, verify these different species. Um, let me see. So you, what you say that um, I think what, one thing that I noticed was that you are actually requiring that people have quite good knowledge about the locality, the area where they are being considered an expert. It's. Uh, a requirement that you are familiar with the surroundings where you find the uh, species. It's not like you can go from south of Norway to north of Norway, just like that. Uh, no, of course, uh, if, if, you, if you, for instance, uh, have worked with vascular plants in the southern parts of Norway, you are not actually familiar with, with uh, the fine-tuning of the distribution limits and such things in the northern parts of Norway, that could be could be a problem. But of course, we have uh, experts that uh, that can can validate uh, in the whole country. But but it differs uh, uh, some. Yeah, depending on the species, maybe or the competence on of the person. Yes. Yes. So. It's it's uh, it shows it tells us that the uh, the the quality assurance and validation is uh, there's a lot of data around it that is also important, and that leads me to you, Bart, because you are going to talk about data about the data, and also standards how we can standardize things. Yeah. So, are you ready to uh, explain those bits to us? Hey, I'm all set, uh, Bente. Thank you uh, again for for having me. So I'll be talking about the Open Geospatial Consortium, Lever Blumpius, and Citizen Science. Um, OGC is involved in a project called Cobweb, which is a citizens' observatory for biological monitoring. Monitoring, you know, the Lever Blumpius, for instance, and we do that with four other sister projects as part of a citizens' observatory. You can click on the link here and find out what the other projects are. But what we noticed that was amongst the project that we needed to share the observations and all the associated metadata that comes with it. So there was definitely a need to interoperate or you know to share those that data. And a better way to do that is to use standards. And so that's what the OGC does. We're 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 a standards developing organization. And um, so the action item that we took was to come up with a, a common definition to show the results of the observations. Quite easy for a lot of applications to upload their data. It becomes a bit more difficult when you want to link up 
all the observations. We can link up the observations of uh, Leifert Blumke, but if you want to relate that to something else, then interoperability becomes a big issue. And um, so that's why um, within the OGC we took the action item to come up with a common definition that is standards based, but importantly is developer friendly and fit for purpose. And in our case, you know, we use biological monitoring as the primary use case to uh, develop that definition. So we use an existing specification in the OGC. It's called a sensor web enablement, which is a family of, of standards that originally comes from the spaceborne uh, sensors, quite complex. Um, and what we did is we, we, we did something that in the standards world is known as profiling. And that means making it fit for purpose for a specific uh, application. The application here being uh, citizen science or people like you and me making observations uh, that can be used by scientists. That means that you need to make a statement of provenance and uh, make a statement of what is the relation or what is the information of the sensor that you took that observation with. And so that's why we focused on two existing standards. One is observations and measurements. That is a standard that we use to capture the observation and um, see what the relationship is, for instance, with the sensor with which you took that observation. Sensor ML is a metadata uh, language, markup, <coughs> excuse me, markup language that is related to the sensor that you're using. <laughs> if you're using a camera, like in your smartphone, there's specific metadata that comes with that camera. Um, you know, that same uh, smartphone could measure temperatures, can measure various things. And so what we did is we made a profile for it so that it is fit for purpose for citizen science. We also wanted that it to be relatively easy to quick start developers of projects. We've heard, uh, Benton, in various of uh, your recordings and um, that there's various applications out there uh, on smartphones, on, uh, uh, in browsers, and so if they could easily quick start using standards, it makes them much easier to share that valuable information. We also build a, a sensor ML library of well-known sensors so that they're immediately uh, usable and equally important you know, also standards based is semantic annotation and that is to associate the uh, observations with established uh, established vocabularies this is something that the OGC and W3C are, are working on, on on best practices on how to do this in the COBE project we are when we do biological observations point to the Darwin core which is which is used by GBIF uh, to semantically annotate the observations and that will help in uh, associating quality what we've heard uh, in another presentation um, so that you can uh, use that semantic annotation to again assign a quality indicator to your observations. We have all that work available on GitHub so if you're using applications feel free to, uh, to check that out. I have it here on my screen um, so you have the URL, it's part of the presentation. And uh, so we have examples of sensor ML, use cases that we use, and the various other building blocks that you can use to build a standards-based uh, application. Uh, all, some of the observations that we have are uh, discoverable in the GEOS portal. So again, here I have a link to it. This is the group on Earth's observation system of systems portal. So again, if I click on this, you can uh, actually see it here. And uh, that's another uh, catalog of various kinds of Earth observations that you can search. And uh, that will contain our citizen science uh, as well, such as our label groupies that we, uh, that we observed this week. So uh, a lot of this information is available at the OGC um, as a profile for uh, a well-known standard that is out there called uh, the sensor web enablement and so that has its specific implementation 
for citizen science. I have a bunch of names up here that uh, feel free to contact us if you would like to have more information on this. So that is myself. Uh, Ingo Zimone is actually the one that created most of the hard work um, on, on this one. Um, I would also like to point out Jamie Williams from Environment Systems in Wales that, and, and Chris Higgins. And again, here the link um, to uh, the GitHub pages. So again, my message here is uh, observations are great. Once you have the need to start sharing those observations and link them up with you know, maybe other observations or other phenomena that you've seen that you probably want to use standards uh, to share that information and easily uh, interoperate. So, um, you know, check out the work that we've done and I'm sure uh, that uh, you like it and if you want to have questions please uh, feel free to send me that email. So with that, then I'll turn it back over to you. Benda? <laughs> Thank you, Bart. Great. Right. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's really as as a citizen. If you 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 uh, act like a citizen, which we also are, and you go out and take a picture. Uh, or make an observation. Well, taking a picture, just to mention that, just taking a picture is already a lot better in terms of having the possibility to validate your observations rather than before where you just have sightings and you had to believe the person who said that there were an observation there. So already that having a picture is, is really improving uh, the quality. and. Yeah. So, but so as a citizen, then so, so you should be as a citizen assured that you know you can really contribute with scientific data. And now today we have heard, uh, we have seen exactly what we can do. Uh, not only using a mobile phone, but we can also use the uh, computer and the internet, which is also sort of a gadget for citizen science. And and then you we have learned, and it's very reassuring to know that we have people working on systematically facilitating making those data into scientific data. There are certain requirements that is needed to, that has to be met in order for, to make them useful uh, for, for science. But then also I think it was Niels who said that uh, a lot of these observations are also used for other purposes and and I think what you do then, Bart, is is to uh, facilitate the combination of the different types in general, and knowing and with standards, we sort of get information about a, a sy systematic way of knowing uh, what kind of quality and what kind the data about the data in a standardized way, so that we can combine them and then know the result of the quality and what we can use them for. Is that close to how that's, you would say it? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, maybe add to that is, um, you know, even in a smartphone, there's so many sensors in that smartphone. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, there's a GPS in here, there's a camera in here, uh, there's, you know, temperatures that you can read. All that can be used to add extra information to your observation that a scientist can use to make, you know, uh, study on or, or, or uh, make this or, or even help decision makers on how they should protect an area and and if you have that scientific validated data it means so much more than just says you know the flower is here and that's it without yeah. having that additional uh, sensor information um, and you know maybe you want to bring in other information as well that you would like to validate and then again if, if you're not using standards then that will be very difficult to do or it'll cost you a lot of time and money to do that. Exactly. And I think uh, that will be uh, the end of today. I don't think there are more questions. Do you have uh, questions concerning your standards while you have Bart here, uh, Nils? Um, well, actually, I'm uh, familiar with the uh, standards uh, that you are using. And uh, actually, uh, species observation system is compliant with uh, Darwin Core, so we are we are mapping when we are sharing data in GABIF and in the Norwegian species the map system, we are mapping that to the Darwin Core standard, and we are 
of course, we are distributing them through the GEBIF uh, network organization. Yeah. And actually, we are we are reading data from uh, foreign institutions that has been in Norway and recorded uh, species. Uh, they uh, we can share. We we are sharing these with the Norwegian society. Super. But that is not an application. That I'm uh, the, uh, the focus here was citizen science. So I, I'm I'm talking about the production system, which has to has a richer user interface and and parameters than. Uh, the, than there uh, ever will be in uh, uh, in uh, Darwin Core. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's great uh, to use a Darwin Core because at least then we'll have a common understanding of the terms, uh, <laughs> which is a good starting point. <laughs> yes, and uh, I mean I will. Th uh, we call it today. Today it's already uh, forty-five minutes uh, on air ha here. I think you, by ending with what you said, Bart, that you are facilitating the combination of different types of data. And tomorrow, uh, we will have Arne Bader, who is an expert on ICT. Uh, he will talk about different data models and how all this data can be made interoperable, as we say. For those of you who are that word maybe not mean that much, but it actually means what Bart said, that you combine different kinds of data and, and get new information based on, on that combination. And that's not straightforward. It needs to be done in a structured way, and uh, we will learn more about that tomorrow as a starting point then for how the data is actually in the end being used. So we have both examples of scientific use, and we have uh, examples of uh, different services used, so in different kinds of management situations, in, in emergency management, uh, etc. And also the link between our little flower in the forest in spring and space. So you will learn uh, more about that tomorrow. I thank you so much, uh, the panel, for your contribution. I think we have uh, set the scene now for even more scientists <laughs> to contribute to the collection. Uh, there are some very good advice on uh, how they can actually help out even more than just download the My Seasons app. So thank you, thank you so much and uh, we are hoping to see you tomorrow as well. Bye-bye. <laughs>